Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in today. I'm Jonathan Cable, a presidential ambassador at Colorado State University. I'm here today with Ali Murphy Paletto, another PA, and with three incredible panelists to discuss working for the public good. Haley Cameron is a 2015 graduate and now serves as Regional Development Director at St. Jude's Children's, Hosp Children's Research Hospital. Emma McKay is a 2020 graduate and now serves as a data coordinator for Together. And last but certainly not least, Stacy Putka is a 2012 graduate and now serves as the Executive Director at Defy Ventures Colorado. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. Happy the working for, Yeah, thank you. The Working for the Public Good session today continues our spring series of live interviews that we will be producing with our alumni and friends of the university in a variety of fields. We hope folks tuning in today are able to use these informational interview videos as learning tools when deciding on their desired career path or when learning about a new industry. We also invite any questions you have for our panelists to be shared in the chat. Many of our attendees are CSU Alumni Association members. Thank you so much for your membership. It makes events like this possible. And to learn more about membership and to explore all that the Alumni Association has to offer, please download our mobile app. The CSU Alumni Association has many virtual events coming up, as well as many past event recordings that are all available to you. I'll include the link in the comments to see our events calendar, and please also check out the subscription to the YouTube channel. Okay, and now we're excited to hear from our panelists today, Haley, Emma, and Stacy. Another huge thank you for joining us. Will each of you take a minute or two to share a little bit about your background and your current organization? Emma, why don't we go ahead and start with you as the most recent graduate? Sure, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, okay, my background in a nutshell, um, I graduated with my undergrad from the University of Denver in 2015. Um, and then pretty quickly after that, um, well, I, I majored in business, uh, international business, um, and after that went to uh, Peace Corps. Uh, I was an economic development volunteer in Senegal, so that's West Africa. Um, learned to speak a new language, spoke a lot of French over there, taught some business skills, um, lived in a pretty small town um, in kind of northern Senegal, kind of in the desert. So ask me any questions about the Peace Corps, I will talk you your ear off. <laughs> um, and then after that, um, I came back home and uh, started the Impact MBA program at CSU, which is what I just finished in 2020. Um, so yeah, through that, I learned a whole lot about um, kind of merging the business world with the nonprofit mm -hmm. and social enterprise world and um, just became really, really passionate about using business practices to make the world a better place. Um, I'm really, I really believe strongly that nonprofits and international development organizations and all sorts of programs like that um, really need to be run just like businesses are. Um, so yeah, I'm really passionate about that. And um, I um, got really interested, especially in statistics uh, while I was doing my MBA program and um, kind of taught myself some basic coding skills on the side um, and did that kind of with the intention of getting into kind of monitoring and evaluation for nonprofits and social enterprises. That's kind of my ultimate goal um, and why I'm working as a data coordinator at Together now. So I'm all about numbers. I'm all about analyzing how impactful an organization has been um, and specifically my job these days is a lot of tracking the data on the kind of services that we provide sorry i should mention together is a um it's a nonprofit that works with young people experiencing homelessness in boulder um, so i track all the services that we provide those young people um, and provide our our grant writer with um with the data that she needs to to get us the cash we need to keep going so that's kind of me in a nutshell um, yeah. I'm happy to go next. Um, 
So my name is Haley Cameron. I work for ALSAC, which is the fundraising and awareness arm of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Um, I graduated from CSU in 2015 with my undergrad in journalism and Spanish, which I'm kind of using both of them, but not really. <laughs> um, I kind of have a very different background than Emma and um, didn't really know that I wanted to end up in the nonprofit world until I got involved with St. Jude. Um, prior to working for ALSAC, I worked um, in sports and radio, and so I thought I wanted to work in the sports and entertainment world, but then I was fundraising for St. Jude and fell in love with it and was able to join um, in our fundraising office in Nashville about three years ago. So I've been working in Nashville for the past three years and then recently moved to our Denver office. So I've been excited to move back home to Colorado. Um, but basically my job is just what I said, fundraising and awareness for St. Jude. So we do lots of local events and work with um, putting on event fundraisers, working with local companies to really spread um, the awareness of the hospital throughout the country. Um, St. Jude is located in Memphis, Tennessee, and um, it's a very unique hospital. It's a primarily research hospital. Um, and so we accept patients from all over the country and all over the world, but St. Jude doctors freely share all of their research with um, other hospitals and other doctors. Um, so patients at the local children's hospital in Colorado um, are probably being treated by St. Jude protocols. Um, when patients do go to Memphis, to the St. Jude campus, um, it's when they're the most dire cases um, of either pediatric cancer or other life-threatening illnesses. Um, and one of my favorite parts about St. Jude is that no family pays for anything. So they don't pay for treatment, travel, housing, or food um, while they're there because we just want to make sure that um, the family can help the child survive. Um, so it's been really fun and I'm excited to be here. I'll jump in next. So my name is Stacy Putka. I'm the executive director for Defy Ventures Colorado. Um, I went to CSU and graduated in 2012. When I see the 20 next to Emma's name, it makes me feel super old, but <laughs> it's amazing how much um, I feel like I've been able to accomplish since graduating and how CSU really set me up for the career path that I've been on. Um, my undergraduate degree is in psychology. I worked in the psychology field for a couple years um, as a milieu counselor um, for the other psychology majors out there. And eventually went to University of Denver to get my master's in social work. Um, I was trained as a clinician providing mental health and substance abuse treatment for individuals who were on parole and probation um, and really became invested in the criminal justice space and in criminal justice reform. So I heard about this wonderful organization called Defy Ventures, which provides entrepreneurial education and character development training to people with criminal histories. Um, working with people who are on probation and parole in the clinical space as part of the system of the criminal justice system, I was pretty frustrated with how that system works um, and just some of the barriers that are inherently built into the system. So the, the thing that I love about Defy is that we're a private nonprofit that gets to work in collaboration with the system. So some of the barriers that people face um, and some of those like big bulky bureaucratic problems that get in the way, we actually get to partner with the system to work on breaking down those barriers for folks who are currently incarcerated. So Defy Ventures operates inside prison and starts working with people while they're incarcerated for an eight month in prison program, again, focusing on job readiness, entrepreneurial education and character development. Um, we have an alumni program. We continue to work with them while they're still incarcerated prior to release. And then we have a pathways to reentry program where we're helping them with basic employment and then ultimately, again, with entrepreneurship. Um, so I'm happy to talk more about Defy throughout the panel as we as we continue to chat. Wow, those are also great. Uh, so the next question that we have um, is you know working for an organization that's committed to serving the public what have you found to be the most rewarding part of your role and what has also been the most challenging thing that you found and i guess we'll start with stacy 
Yeah, I think <laughs> it's really interesting. The most rewarding part of my work, obviously, is seeing the outcomes of the program participants that we work with, seeing people come out of prison and actually have a fair shot at reentry um, and success after incarceration is hugely rewarding. And for the purposes of the panel, though, I'd like to talk more about the reward of working with a team um, and leading a team as the executive director, being able to facilitate people's careers and careers in the fields that Emma Haley and I all work in, where we're serving people and really keeping that at the center of our work. It's so fun to see the rest of the team grow professionally and empower them to do work that is supporting the communities that they care about the most. Um, we have a we have a really small but mighty team. Another graduate of CSU is our program director, and our senior operations associate was actually in our program in prison. Um, he was one of the very first program participants to go through and works for us now and is an integral part of our team. And we simply wouldn't be able to do the work that we do um, without him. So that's that's the most rewarding thing that I feel like every single day is reinforced by the work that we do. I can go next. I would say, um, you know, same things as Stacey, just in a different world, in the healthcare world, um, just being able to see the discoveries made at St. Jude and cures made for cancer, which is just such a huge thing that everyone wants to see and wants to make happen. Just knowing that, you know, we're a small part of it by helping raise this money um, to keep the hospital running. Um, St. Jude, when it opened in 1962, the overall childhood cancer survival rate was 20%. Um, today, it's more than 80%. And a lot of that is um, the discoveries that have been made there. So just being able to say that you're a small part of that, I think, um, is so rewarding. And then did you ask challenges too, Jonathan? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, I would say it's there's a million great nonprofits, so it's hard. And it's um, you get a lot of no's when you're, especially in my job in fundraising, when you're asking people for money and, you know, it's hard to hear no and then have the um, you know motivation to go on and ask somebody else, um, and it's also hard when you talk to someone and they may not or may not feel as passionate as you do. You're like, well, come on, why not? <laughs> um, even though there's so many, so many great organizations, um, so it's just knowing like you have to be very dedicated, and it's it's a lot of work, but it's definitely worth it. And then I guess, Emma, if you'd also want to answer that question. And I believe you're muted, too. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying I was frozen, so I was trying to figure out what was going on there. Um, yeah, so for me, I would say, gosh, I mean, there's in this field, the best thing is is that you get so many rewards from it, you know? Um, but for me, I would say the most rewarding thing is the, all the things that I get to learn from the people that I work with. Um, you know, you might go into this field and think, oh, you know, this is the field of, of helping people. Um, you're the one kind of assisting, assisting others. And, and that in itself is really rewarding. But for me, it's really felt kind of, sounds kind of cheesy, but kind of the opposite, like, I am learning so much from the people that, you know, are participating in the programs that I'm, that I'm working on, you know, in the Peace Corps, especially, you know, you talk about that a ton because you're working with people from an entirely different culture. Um, and, you know, I came back from that having learned way more than I could have taught, um, you know, just about that culture and different ways of living. Um, but I experienced the same thing. Um, I think I forgot to mention, but during my MBA, I co-founded a nonprofit that helped people um, dealing with the repercussions of COVID. And we were delivering um, supplies to people who didn't feel comfortable leaving their house. Um, so I got to speak 
with a lot of people on the phone that I never would have spoken with otherwise, you know, people whose lives didn't really like, you know, connect with mine in other ways. But I, you know, I got to learn the old or the, the, the story, the lifelong story of an 80 year old woman who, you know, didn't have any kids. So she just wanted to share, you know, her life story. And I, that was incredibly rewarding. Um, and I've only been knit together for about three months. Um, so, and of course it's been during COVID. So I've mostly been working remotely, but what I'm looking forward to the most in that position is when I am able to go back in person, I'll get to interact with the, the youth that we work with. And, you know, where, where else in my life am I going to get that opportunity to get to interact with these youth who have had very different life experiences from mine? Um, so for me, that's been the most rewarding, but I could I could talk for hours about, you know, all the other things that are great about this field. Um, in terms of the most challenging, um, I guess it's kind of hard to explain, but I would say it's um, the idea or the, the realization that working on projects that are, you know, meant to make people's lives better is very similar to, you know, being in a really intense, challenging, like startup process. Um, you know, you know, like I said, in, in my intro, I'm, I really believe that nonprofits and international development orgs and whatnot are very similar to businesses. And so in that sense, you know, when you start up a business, it's likely to fail. You know, you start up a business, it's all about learning. What do my customers want? What do they need? How much are they willing to pay me? Am I going to be able to make a profit off of this? And it's very similar when you're starting up a nonprofit or you're starting up a new project at your at your organization or something like that, because it's all a learning process and you're going to kind of go down the wrong path and maybe waste some resources, you know, maybe try to fix something that didn't actually need to be fixed. Um, and that can be really especially difficult in this field because you know, when you're trying to help people, it feels so critical. You know, I would imagine for Haley with, you know, St. Jude, you know, it's people's lives are at stake. Um, so that can be challenging, just like that realization that you will fail and it's not all going to go perfectly. Um, and then I think kind of to add on top of that, there's kind of this culture in the nonprofit world where, what was it called? It's called like the overhead myth, this concept that you, with nonprofits, you have to spend a certain a certain percentage of your donations have to come in um, and go directly toward your services. Um, it's a thing that, you know, we're starting to climb out of, but there is this mentality that you have to put all of your resources toward exactly what your mission is, but that makes it really difficult to actually do things well, to allow for innovation, to allow for creativity, to you know, pay your employees well enough so that they stick around and, and there's not a lot of employee turnover, things like that. So kind of cracking through that mentality can be a little bit challenging in this field, I would say. Thank you all for those fantastic answers. We're going to shift gears a little bit with this next question. And it's, is there any encouragement or advice you'd like to offer our students and alumni as they pursue their careers? And why don't we start with Haley on this one? Yeah, I would say, gosh, as cheesy as it kind of sounds, like finding something that you're passionate about. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, I never thought I'd be working in nonprofit. Um, you know, I worked as a marketing director for a radio station out of college. And, you know, I completely shifted gears because I fell in love with the mission of St. Jude. And it was something that I was excited about um, to work for every day. Um, so I think definitely just finding something you love. And especially if you're on this panel, you probably love the nonprofit world and giving back. Um, finding a cause you care about and it really just makes going to work every day so much, so much better. Sure. Um, I can jump in. I mean, I absolutely agree with everything Haley said. Um, it's absolutely worth it. And, you know, despite all the challenges that um, we've all listed, um, what you get out of it is so much more. Um, in terms of, I guess, practical advice, I would say um, 
it's really beneficial in this field to to remember that um, like hard skills are still really really helpful. Um, like for me, I mentioned earlier that I got really interested in statistics, um, and that's not something in my undergrad I ever would have thought. Oh yeah, like statistics is the way to go for me to work in the nonprofit world, you know, and have a have a blossoming career. You know, statistics are cool, but you know, I want to learn about you know social justice issues and things like that, and all of that is super important as well. But just remember that hard skills like statistics, like you know, even project management or, you know, math, things like that um, are incredibly useful, even in the nonprofit world, even in the international development world, you can apply pretty much any training that you've had to this world, because it's just, you know, it's just like a business in my, in my opinion. Um, so go ahead and like learn those skills that you don't think necessarily applies because I promise it will, um, programming, that kind of thing. We need it in this world. So, I would say to kind of to tag on to what Emma said, and also something you said earlier at the beginning of the panel, Emma, of treating nonprofit like business. There are so many times that we will make different adjustments or change our way of thinking about things because it's a nonprofit and there's a social good involved. Um, and at the end of the day, it has to be run in the same way or you're just not getting the same impact um, for the folks that you're serving. So the same as in a business, you're putting all of your resources, your research, your, your time and effort into the product or the service of the business the people that you're serving need to remain at the center of what you're doing. And there's in nonprofit, there's so many different stakeholders. You have donors, you have foundations, you might have corporate people that are giving um, and you have the clients that you serve. And it's really easy to get distracted or to change your approach because of different stakeholder input. And if we can bring it back to the people that you're serving and really what your core mission is consistently the same as you would for a business that will have better outcomes for your program participants and or or organism whoever you're serving right um and it will also help the the organization thrive um and remain cash flow positive right awesome those were great answers. I think, yeah, it's definitely encouraging to know that, you know, it's not all uh, the things of just, you know, you start, go from school, from CSU, and then automatically you know exactly how all your skills um, will immediately translate. And so it's really encouraging to hear how you all kind of came through some transformation to where you are today. And so um, that kind of leads into the next question. Um, so we've collected a handful of questions um, from our um, people that are joining us today virtually. And so one of those questions was uh, a recent grad is wondering, when do you know that it's time to move on to the next position? And we will start with Emma. Sure. I mean, that's a really good question. And I, I hesitate to say that I would be an expert at answering it just because um, I have followed kind of a, a, a unique career path. And this the position I'm in currently is my first full-time position, even though I graduated several years ago. Um, but for me, thinking about this position um, that I'm in right now that I just started a couple of months ago, I'm constantly thinking about what do what does the, my organization together need from me? Um, and when would it be beneficial for both of us to leave? Um, so I don't have any plans to leave together anytime in the near future, but I do have in the back of my head a plan for what I want to see accomplished through my role. Um, and for me, that involves gathering all of our data and having it in one place in one database and having it easily accessible and having a very clear guide for whoever were to come after me um, to help them, you know, navigate the system. So, you know, even if I feel like I could get maybe a higher paying job or a different one that for whatever reason is better for me, I wouldn't feel comfortable leaving until I kind of 
get to that place where I feel like it's a it's kind of mutually beneficial. Um, so that's kind of the way that I look at it. Um, but you also have to remember that your own personal mental health and well-being is the most important thing. <laughs> you know, that that comes above all other things. So, you know, take that into account first. If you're not happy in your job, it then it's not mutual mutually beneficial for your organization either. You know, if you're if you're miserable, then you're not going to be able to help anyone, you know. Put your oxygen mask on first. Um so that's a huge thing to remember. Um and yeah, move on when you're excited to learn something new and somebody else could come in and take your place relatively easily. That's what I would say. I think that there's there's different, there's those are all great points, Emma. And one thing that I've also noticed in my career with all the I've changed positions several times and usually I was kind of being pulled towards the new position. Um, several times it was people kind of seeking me out and saying, you know, I think that you would be great in this position because of X, Y, and Z. That's how I, you know, I started as the program director at Defy um, and became the executive director last year. And that was because the board reached out and said, I think that you would be great in this position. So making sure that you're staying open to those options. And if people are reaching out with new opportunities, and if you're in the nonprofit world, that will happen a lot. Everyone's always looking for new great talent in nonprofit. Um, so keeping this like guiding post of where you want your career to go in the long term, um, if doing direct service only was was my passion and the only thing that I that I wanted to do and I wanted to stay very focused on that, switching into this position wouldn't have been a good idea for me. Um, but leading social change, leading teams, empowering others to do the work was something I was interested in. So it was a good fit. Um, so I think it's really important to not think about job title or salary as much, but more so what do you want your day-to-day -day functions to be? And you might find yourself getting pulled into those positions throughout your career. Um, the other thing that I would say is when we're working in nonprofit, we're usually serving some type of underserved population. And I think it's really important that we're finding ways to empower people in those populations to take on leadership roles within the organization in the long term. So my goal for Defy is that in the next 10 years, I've been able to facilitate leadership transformation for someone who was in our program in prison, who ultimately can take my job as executive director at Defy. Um, and I think that that also keeps us really focused on serving the people that we're intended to serve and making sure that we're coming up with solutions that really work for them, um, that don't necessarily work for us or for our, our donor base. Those are my two thoughts about that. I agree with all that. I don't know if I have much to add, but um, I would say from my perspective, I went from for-profit to nonprofit. And so if you're kind of thinking about making that switch, um, you know, really kind of what I said earlier about finding something that you're passionate about and wanting to do every day, um, if you can find somewhere to use your skills for a nonprofit, um, I mean, I say, honestly, go for it. Um, something else I would say is nonprofit is a lot. And I think Emma kind of alluded to this earlier that, um, you know, it's really important for nonprofits to keep costs down because we're a lot of times running on donor dollars. And so we want to respect the people who donate money to us. And so keep admin costs low. Um, and so a lot of times we're under short staffed and we are working a lot of hours and there's a lot of burnout. So I would say too, if you're in a nonprofit job that like you're, you're burnt out, you're having a really hard time, you know, maybe you start looking for other, other places or how you can kind of find a new role to where you're not exhausting yourself so quickly, because I think that's a huge um, issue in the nonprofit world is burnout because we are doing a million jobs at once and wearing a million hats because we are trying to make sure that as much of the money that we raise or that we have goes back to um, 
the mission. So, I mean, I feel lucky with my organization. They're very, very aware of that. And um, so for me, that's why I know it's not time to move on to the next role. But um, I think that's something to keep in mind when you're working in the nonprofit world. Thank you all for those. I'm personally learning a lot. I hope that our viewers are also. Um, I'm gonna combine two questions with this next ask I have of you all. So the first is, we received one that said, uh, what are the best steps or tactics to be well-respected within the communities where you want to work? And the second part is in, um, our degrees, uh, we're told that we should be part of communities that we're serving, but this has become increasingly difficult in COVID. Do you have any advice on how to connect with these communities virtually? So Stacy, would you like to start with this one? Sure, I love this question and I love the, the folks that are asking it where, you're, where your mind is at because that is one of the most important things. And I, I've mentioned that a couple different times throughout the panel is keeping the folks that you're serving at the center of your work. The best way to do that is to talk to them and to get their feedback. Um, we are lucky in some ways, but also it faces that we face unique challenges with talking to our community virtually because they're in prison and uh, the internet is not a thing in prison. There's no Wi-Fi. They don't have laptops back in the unit. Um, but we do have really great partners at the community, at the corrections facilities that allow us to speak with folks virtually. So what we have been able to do is set up times kind of like a, uh, uh, you know, similar to if you if you had a coffee shop gathering time and you said, we'll be at the coffee shop from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. the third Thursday of the month or something like that. And you invited people that you serve to come to those times. That was common practice before COVID. Um, and we've been doing the same thing virtually. So we'll be on Zoom from these times to these times. If you can get over to a computer if you're able to access it, um, we'll be able to meet with you during those times. When you are serving under underserved or under-resourced populations, um, virtual meetups might not be an option. If you're working with kids who are experiencing poverty or um, a Emma working with together with kids who are experiencing homelessness, it's, it's not easy for them to meet virtually. So think creatively about how you can meet with people. Can you send letters? Um, can you post a box somewhere and ask people to write write their own notes and their own feedback and, and drop it into a box? Um, call people on the phone and meet up with them that way. I think that a little bit more effort has to go into working with populations right now, um, but just thinking creatively about what resources people have available. And if you can, bridge gaps um, for those for those resources. Before COVID, uh, we were able to meet with people when they were returning home from prison in person. Now we can't meet with them in person. So we provide everyone with a Chromebook and a cell phone, and that allows us to be able to keep tabs on them and to, to help them with what they need. Um, so I think that those two things are really important. And a resource that I also wanted to say um, is wonderful is called community-centric fundraising. Um, it, it helps kind of strike this balance between fundraising and keeping the populations that you serve at, at the center of those conversations. Um, so just something to look into. If you Google community-centric fundraising, you'll find their website. Kind of going off of that, being that I work, my job is all fundraising, um, you know, the audiences that I work with are different. Um, you know, I don't necessarily work with patients directly. Uh, if you know anything about hospitals, there's a lot of HIPAA regulations and things like that. Um, but what our team has really tried to do, especially with COVID, is connect our donors to our patients and families um, virtually. And so creating virtual fundraising events and, you know, through Zoom or we, they created, um, a online like magazine basically called St. Jude Inspire, where they share patient stories a lot more um, often than before COVID um, because we used to be able to take 
you know, different groups to the hospital to tour it, to show them kind of here's where your money is going or hold conferences at the hospital and show um, our donors what's going on there. And obviously that's changed a lot. Um, so with, I would say, kind of a different perspective from Stacy's, um, working on the fundraising side, a lot of like the audiences that I work with are our donors. And so um, to the question, how do you stay well-respected in those audiences? Um, and this is also kind of back to what Emma was saying, you know, nonprofit is a business. Um, so it's very salesy when you're in fundraising. So it's how are you pitching a CEO of a company versus a 75-year-old volunteer? Um, it's going to be very different how you um, approach these people. And so just kind of knowing where everyone's coming from and knowing maybe why they support your cause and um, really being able to approach them, you know, if it's a 75-year-old volunteer, they're not getting on Zoom. So picking up the call or picking up the phone to call them or, you know, starting now that people are starting to get vaccinated, you know, planning distanced events and such like stuff like that. Um, so just kind of knowing who you're dealing with and how everyone interacts differently. I think in nonprofits, you're dealing with so many different people. So like I said, kind of before too, you're wearing so many different hats. So you need to be able to know how to approach um, different groups. Yeah, um, I definitely agree. I think one thing that I would add is just this common theme for me is meeting people where they're at um, in all projects that I'm working on. Um, in during my MBA, I did a I was part of a team that was researching the viability of starting a social enterprise that focused around teaching young people sexual health um, skills. And we were focusing a lot in um, Memphis, Tennessee, where, you know, it's a Bible belt. There's a lot of people that are very religious. And um, it was really important for us with our kind of very liberal minded group um, when it came to sex, sexual health to um, really put ourselves in the shoes of the people that we were trying to assist and to remember, you know, oh, if you come with these religious values, then it might be difficult to talk about sex in this way. So that's just kind of one example where we really, really tried to picture ourselves with the same values as the people that we were serving. Um, and it was definitely a theme for me in the Peace Corps as well, working with a culture that was completely different from mine. It was really important. Um, if I wanted to get to know them at all, I had to really open my mind um, and be willing to take in kind of the way that they viewed the world. Um, so that's kind of a broad way of answering that question. Um, and in terms of COVID, it's difficult. It's so difficult. And I would just piggyback off of what um, Stacy and Haley have said. Um, there's creative ways of getting to know the people you serve, even if it's impossible to actually talk to them. Um, reading books, you know, that are maybe by similar people or um, just have characters in them that might be similar to the people that you're serving, um, you know, watching documentaries and putting yourselves in, in situations that, you know, get you to interact with other types of people that maybe might not be the exact same people that you're serving, but goes along with that theme of just opening your mind and, and getting to know other people. So I would say. Yeah, those are all fantastic. So, um, so switching gears again, um, so knowing that most nonprofits and organizations for public good um, are low paying, um, what advice do you have for graduates and students considering going into a nonprofit field? Um, what advice do you have for them for um, negotiating salary? And we can start with Emma. That's a tough one, I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, the nonprofit world, unfortunately, you know, is lower paying. And um, I personally hope that's something that changes, you know, something I'm really passionate about that, um, you know, people who work in the nonprofit world should be getting paid the same amount for the same type of work. And we're actually going to make a bigger difference um, if we're paying people like we would just in a regular enterprise. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, turnover is a huge problem in the nonprofit world because people are constantly leaving, trying to get you know a higher salary, which is reasonable. Um, I would say 
in terms of negotiating, I'm not going to say that I have the best advice. I've, you know, I've gotten one job <laughs> that uh, uh, this one that I'm in now. And I personally was so excited about it that I didn't negotiate. Um, and maybe I should have. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I would say, just remember that your skills are really valuable and that it is worth negotiating and, and nonprofits, I think, um, would be less likely to just, you know, toss away your application just because you tried to, to, to negotiate. Typically, um, the people that you'd be working for are, you know, open to that. And even if they're not able to give it to you, it's worth asking. Um, but that, that's me just offering that advice tentatively, because like I said, I've only ever <laughs> accepted this one position that's full-time and paid and I didn't negotiate. So I'll pass it off to Haley and Stacy. <laughs> Yeah, I, would, I mean, I agree. I would say just being your own advocate, um, it is harder because there's less positions, there's less, it's harder to research, but just really kind of advocating for yourself and knowing what you can bring to the table and showing that. Um, I would definitely say do your research. It's it's harder to find positions, but they're still out there. So you can look look up or different job titles on Glassdoor and different places like that and kind of see what that position might make and see what you're being offered if it's um, around there or if you can ask for more and, you know, bring your research and say, well, you know, I researched and found that people with this title at this company are making this and see if that helps you. Um, I would say too, also look at the whole package because, um, you know, a lot of nonprofits offer different things. So it might be more flexibility or it might be better benefits or, you know, something like that, that you might not get with a normal corporate job. And just knowing that you have that whole package. Um, for example, you know, my office is very, very flexible. So when we need a time off, if we work a, an event on a Saturday, I can take a day off without taking a vacation day, you know? So just kind of knowing what you're getting into and knowing like, Yes, salary is a big deal, but it's not the whole picture. I agree with everything that Haley and Emma said. Um, and as someone who's in a hiring position and who makes the decisions about how much everyone gets paid um, and what we're listing positions as, a few things to keep in mind. They just passed a law this year that when you post a job position, you have to include a salary range with that. So make sure that employers are including that salary range with the job description. Um, and don't be afraid to talk about money. It, it's everything that Emma and Haley have said. Talk about it in your interview, ask questions. Um, it makes it a lot easier now with the salary being included in the job description to say, I saw that the included salary range is this. And if you've done your research, like Haley said, and have comparable salaries, it makes it super easy to bring it up in the conversation. Um, if I was hiring someone and they said to me, you know, I see that the range, the max for this position is 65,000. Um, and I think that I could help bring additional value to the organization. Let's say I was hiring someone for a position like Haley's where they're working on development. Um, and you asked a few questions about the annual budget and set kind of a fundraising goal in the interview and said, I think I could bring in this much more funding for the organization. If I met that goal, would there be room for an increase at that time? Um, everyone in nonprofits is thinking about how we're bringing in enough money to support the organization. So if you can show that value and show how you're going to add value in the interview process and ask up front, is there room for performance increases based on how much I'm bringing in, um, people will be willing to work with you on that. Because if, if they have to do less fundraising because you're helping with it, um, they're happy to pass that along for the overall health of the organization. So I guess we have another question. Um, in the comments that kind of goes off of this idea of um, you know being hired and entering the workforce for nonprofits and so uh, the question is um, that as a 2021 grad I was wondering if you have advice for meeting with potential employers virtually as well knowing folks at nonprofits are already so busy is there a better way to connect with people like you all and anybody can jump at that 
Um, I would say just networking is so important. And I know it's hard virtually, but even if you can reach out to, you know, one of us and we can connect you with someone with that we might know with an organization or you find somebody on LinkedIn and just send them a message and say, do you have 15 minutes to talk on a Zoom meeting? Um, anything like that, I think just is so important. Nonprofit jobs, you know, depending on the organization are sometimes harder to come by because again, we don't hire as many people. It's, you know, kind of, there's only opportunities if someone leaves or, you know, if the company's growing, but it's, it's a lot harder and sometimes more competitive. So just getting to know anybody with any organization you're interested in. I say, you know, emails, LinkedIn, Zoom meetings, um, setting up a meeting for, you know, a few months down the road when things might be a little bit better with COVID, um, stuff like that. I know with my job, I met the people at St. Jude through a fundraiser I was working on and I stayed in contact with them. And then there was a position that opened up and they could um, be references for me. So I think just anything you can to get your foot in the door. Um, yeah, I would say one benefit of this field is that um, people who are working in these jobs are usually pretty passionate about the work that they do and they're pretty excited to talk about it. Um, so yes, folks who work for nonprofits might be more busy than your typical people, but um, remember that they really, really care about the work. And if you care about it too, then it, I know speaking for myself, I would be more than happy to talk to somebody about the work that I'm doing and, you know, help them get to a place where they can be, you know, helping the people, the same people that I'm trying to help. Um, so remember that and, and don't feel like you're stepping on people's toes too much. If you do reach out to somebody on LinkedIn, um, it, for me, at least, you know, it's exciting to get those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, you can even just ask for like 15 minutes. If, if you're really worried about taking up someone's time, it's amazing what 15 minutes can do um, just over a video chat or, you know, a quick coffee or something like that. Um, because, just in that quick time, you can get connected to so many other people um, and it'll really expand your network. So it's worth just just be bold. Just go out there and reach out to strangers. It's worth it. <laughs> I completely agree with that, Emma. Whenever I meet up with someone, that's what I kind of see as the purpose of the meeting is what introductions can I make for you? Um, so if you're going into meetings with people when you're networking, knowing what introductions you want, stalk people on LinkedIn, see what, what connections they have that you find interesting, ask leading questions to get there. You know, oh, I see you volunteered with St. Jude, who else do you know there? Um, and, and kind of lead people to thinking about those introductions on their own. I would also say treat volunteer opportunities like Haley did and internships as real serious networking opportunities and job interviews. Um, if I have, you know, we don't pay our interns, but if I have an intern who does a stellar job for me, there are tons of connections that I'm willing to make for them. Um, and I'm willing to take a lot more time to help them in their career moving forward than an intern that kind of does a, a mediocre job. Um, so while you might not get paid for internship opportunities, take those really seriously. Um, we're also looking for interns too. Shameless plug. If anyone's interested, you can reach out to me after the panel. Just to jump on that as well, like I would say too, sometimes if you can't find an internship, but it looks like you have one with Stacy, um, <laughs> you know, just offering to volunteer. Even during COVID, there's still things that we need. Like if you reach out and say, I would love to volunteer for your organization, are there ways I can help? You know, sometimes we might need people to just sit at home and make phone calls or, just do like little things like that. So that's a great way to get your foot in the door too. And, you know, then be remembered and you can say, you can put that on a resume and say, I volunteered for whichever organization and a great way to connect with them as well. Yes, thank you all. And we do have, I believe, one more question from the chat that I would like to ask you. And that is, do you have any advice for dealing with the failures when they feel like people's well-being and lives hang in the balance? And I'll let whoever would like to jump on that one, go ahead. I can, I guess I can start there. 
Obviously, that's a really, really tough question. It's what I listed was, you know, one of the biggest challenges for me. Um, I think what's really important for me to remember, um, especially when I'm working with like marginalized populations, um, is to remember that a lot of the people you work for, while they might be struggling in certain areas, you know, like the the program participants that together are dealing with homelessness, and that's horrible, and we want to fix that. Um, however, it's important to remember that that's not what defines them, and there's so much more to who they are than what they're currently struggling with. Um, we just went through a rebrand. Um, we're now called Together, and uh, we used to be called Attention Homes, and one of the big reasons why we did that rebrand was because we believe really passionately in showing that the population that we work with is strong and empowered and happy. We used to have some pictures on our website that were sort of kind of down the line of like poverty porn, which drives me crazy. You know, these sad grayed out pictures of someone who's really struggling to try to motivate people to donate. And in some ways that can be really beneficial. Um, but at least at Together, it's our belief that it's much better to show that population as one that's thriving and just needs a little help in this one area because they're strong and empowered and amazing. And I felt the same way with my um, the nonprofit I worked on in grad school and in the Peace Corps. Peace Corps especially, you know, it's so easy to think, oh, I'm going to this town and I'm going there because they're, they're, they're dealing with poverty. People there are hungry. Um, but what I learned when I was there was that, yes, they're dealing with those problems and they're awful and we should help. Um, but they're also some of the happiest people I've ever met, probably even happier than I've ever been um, because they have a stronger community or they have, you know, this religion that really grounds them in life. And so that that's what really keeps me going is remembering what else is there beyond their struggles. I would say it's really important to keep failure in perspective. Um, you know, if I miss a meeting, if I forget that I have a meeting and I just don't show up, that that's <laughs> not a great thing. But that also doesn't mean that my program participants aren't going to get a job when they get out of prison because I missed a meeting. Um, when we're thinking about like what success for our organizations really look like, putting our energy and our time and our thoughtfulness into that. Um, for my role specifically, I have to make sure that we have enough funding to continue on as an organization. So a, a real true failure for me would be to not raise enough money um, or to not forecast correctly and to run out of funds. And then we can't serve the people that we were serving anymore. Um, so I put a lot of time and resources and get additional eyes on those things. You know, our board is constantly reviewing our budget and helping us raise money to ensure that we were hitting our fundraising goals and that we're not adding line items to the budget until the fundraising goals have been hit. Um, and that is something that I really put a priority on where if, you know, I forget to call someone back or I forget a meeting, those things are not going to cause the organization to shut down. So be gentle with yourself. Everyone is going to make mistakes. We're all going to have many failures. But how do those really impact the bottom line of the organization? And if you know this one thing is a big failure, put the time and the resources and the energy towards it so that you can continue to serve the people that you need to. And when you make other mistakes, just be graceful with yourself and think of solutions to not make them again in the future. Um, but remember that they, they're they not all life and death decisions. I agree with that 100%, especially from a fundraising standpoint. Um, I think a perfect example is COVID and how it kind of turned the nonprofit world upside down because people were losing jobs. People didn't know if they were going to lose their job. So a lot of our revenue was very unknown. You know, for me, a lot of my job is in-person events. So it's dinners, galas, golf tournaments, 5Ks. It's things like that that were all shut down for the past year. 
So I think our leadership team panicked. We all panicked quite a bit. And it was, you know, we had a certain amount of money we had to raise to keep the lights on at the hospital, you know, putting it kind of point blank. And so it was how can we, instead of looking at that, like looking at that as a failure, how can we innovate and find other ways to fundraise and reach our audiences who may not have been impacted by COVID as hard, you know, reach those people that those corporations that still have money and, you know, how can we kind of pivot? I'm sure everyone's sick of hearing the word pivot this past year, but our um, fundraising plans to make sure that we don't fail. Um, but I think at the same time, exactly what Stacey just said, if you just let failure kind of um, always be in the back of your mind, you're going to be very unhappy and <laughs> very stressed out, um, especially in nonprofit. But I think it's just you know, thinking of, okay, well, if this isn't going to work, we still have to raise this money. We still have to do this for these people. So what will we do instead? So I think a nonprofit failure is almost not an option. Um, it's <laughs> instead of, you know, this not happening, how do we make it happen? Um, and this past year has been a lot of that, but it's definitely shown at least me and my team, you know, how we can still do things in a virtual world and in a completely different world, which has been exciting, but I'm ready for things to get back to normal. I hear you on that, Haley. <laughs> I agree. And thank all three of you. This has been invaluable. And just joining us today means a lot to the Alumni Association, uh, the PAs, et cetera. Um, Haley, Emma, and Stacy, you are all incredible. If you do have a moment for our viewers to fill out the post-event survey, your feedback is greatly appreciated and it will be linked in the comments. We do thank you all for joining us. Please have a great day. Stay safe, stay stalwart, and go Rams.